Hey, welcome to the Mario Dottillo Show. I'm your host, Mario Dottillo. I've been investing in mobile home parks and other commercial real estate for years. And on this show, we interview some really interesting and successful real estate investors and business owners. We go behind the scenes on how they do what they do. I know you're going to get a ton of value out of this, so stick around till the end. Hey guys, super excited because I've got Gary Harper with the CEO of Sharper Business Solutions on. He's a good friend of mine. He's an absolute rock star when it comes to systemizing companies and has a, has a serious niche in real estate investments. And um, one thing I want to point out about Gary before we get started here is he's kind of like the guy behind the scenes to a lot of the super successful entrepreneurs and real estate investors that all of you know. And he's kind of the one behind the, behind the curtain, pulling the strings, teaching these guys how to systemize and scale their company. So huge pleasure of mine to have you on. Gary, thanks for being on today, man. Of course, Mario. I am. I thank you for the awesome introduction and I'm humbled and, uh, and also really honored to be a part of the show. And, and I can't say enough about you either, Mario. It's a humble giving spirit, loves to help other people. And you don't see that a lot in real estate, right? I mean, if you think back 20 years ago, like it was taboo to help other people in real estate, you know, it's taboo to kind of help them and invest in them. And and you've broke the mold on that. And I appreciate you having me on the show. Means a lot. Thank you. So interesting. Gary has built, well, he started, and I'll let you tell your story, Gary, but he's consulted many of the largest companies that we all know of around the country and really around the world. And so what he's done is taken everything that he learned from consulting these large multi-billion dollar companies and is helping entrepreneurs implement them in their smaller family size or, or smaller companies and, and really scale their company. So Gary, why don't we just start out and kind of give everybody an idea of your story, how you got to where you're at today. And we're sure. going to jump into some super good stuff, guys. So stick around. Yeah, actually before the whole... Uh, business solutions uh, aspect of my knowledge. I started in real estate. 97, I moved to Chicago. All right, I have to back it up a couple of years. 95, I moved to Chicago. I got married in 97 in Chicago. But um, started working with my brother-in-law, Wayne Schaefer, right out in Northwest Indiana. And he taught me a lot about real estate. And, you know, the whole Robert Kiyosaki model was like very in full bloom at that point. And I don't know if you remember the guy, but I bought the Carlton Sheets course back then and kind of dates me a little bit. He recently passed away, which is really sad. But those gentlemen like were pioneering a lot of the education, the Ron Legrands of the world, right? And uh, as we know them. And so we started learning that knowledge and passive income. And I got into real estate in 97, 98 and pretty much pretty much going at it pretty good by 99, but uh, it was more of a laborer. My brother-in-law hired me and taught me to work for him. And I did that. And so by 2004, I was uh, going full fledged in real estate, started my own property management company, was buying a lot of rentals and going after that cash flow dream, right? That was being taught that those those four quadrants. And um, I'm not sure that I did it all right either, right? I mean, I bought wrong, went too deep into the purchases, the loan to values weren't really a focus on mine because I was more about the cash flow. And boy, the 2008 market really crashed hard and it took me out in that regard. And uh, so we, we did a little bit of uh, soul searching during that time, but that's where I got into real estate. Back up though, till 97, I, I also became around the same time, went into corporate America. And so I had these dual lives going, one in real estate as an entrepreneur, and then this other one in, in, in the world of consulting. And I started off actually at entry level positions working for a company and then worked my way up quickly to an executive level. And uh, I was a national manager by the time I was 23 years old for a company called ARO, Ministry of Resource Options. And then uh, would go around the country and did business analysis for companies and came in and gave them a, a feedback on how they could better run their records and their their um, you know their non-core functions of their business and, and their processes and their systems and things like that. I started getting different types of training, certifications in, uh, in Six Sigma and, and Fundamentals of Quality and and lean processes and things like that. And so that the love for business understanding the process was born. By the time I you know, was going full speed into real estate and then I had this career going in corporate America, I'd reached the executive level, had almost 750 employees and um, really in the, in, the, in the throes of, uh, of real estate at the same time, the market crashed, the economy started turning down 2008 to 2010, uh, felt, definitely felt the weight of that. But then uh, the Lord actually put uh, another obstacle in my path at that point. It was a thing called Lyme disease. And I went back to like a five-year-old mental state for a good long six to eight months. And so my world changed. I had to end up, uh, you know, end up walking away from the corporate America job, not able to perform it at the level that I needed to. 
And then uh, real estate crashed on me. And so I ended up, you know, in a really bad place and yeah, physically, mentally, emotionally. I mean, I was not in a good place at all. And, uh, and my wife was, uh, and, my, and my kids supported me through that and helped me through that time. Coming out of that, though, um, I found myself restoring my health. And I found my love for real estate to come back. And me, the gentleman I talked to you about a minute ago, Wayne, actually helped me get back into real estate at that point. But from a different perspective altogether, um, I had no desire at all to own a bunch of rentals and be, you know, I call it tenants and toilets, right? <laughs> I didn't want to own tenants and toilets anymore. And so, um, and not that it couldn't have worked or, you know, obviously that crash 2008 took a lot of people down. And then not that it's a bad model today. I truly believe done the right way, you can make money in single family and rentals. And even, uh, you know, like um, lease with options and things like that, different plays. But my, my love and passion went more towards like getting in and getting out. So we started doing wholesaling. And it eventually evolved into fix and flip and buy and hold and things like that again. But by 2016, I uh, have worked with uh, my brother-in-law and his team to do over 1,400 deals as a team. And, uh, and that means we bought and sold, right? So that wasn't just like total number of transactions. It was a bought and sold. If you double that, it'd be 2,800 transactions. But the total was around 1,400 or a little more than that. One year, we actually did 300 in one year. And Jeez. we had a really, yeah, and just in that one year. So it was interesting. And again, I don't take credit for that. That was a team. That was an approach. Uh, what I would say that I brought to that team at that point, though, and the reason why me and my brother-in-law partnered is the systems and processes, how to run the business. And so we started implementing the things that I do today and what I did in corporate America for all those years, helping to create a vision, helping to create processes, helping hire right people, helping them measure, measure and monitor the right metrics in your organization, help to not only document the process, but lean it out and curate the procedures and policy that go along with it. Uh, so those different things became important to us and we've created a focus around them and you have the right people pulling in the right direction. And you can see right, really good results when you do that. Communication was healthy. The meeting structures were well. Um, from that in 2016, I was encouraged by my brother-in-law and another gentleman, Tom Olson, actually on our team to step out and try helping other people. And, uh, and we had gotten to a point where financially I could, and, uh, we recovered from that 2008 to 2010 loss and we were at a healthy place. And me and my wife, uh, went out and helped a couple of entrepreneurs and we saw success with them. They grew quickly. And, uh, and it wasn't really, um, Mario, to be honest with you, I don't think it was a desire of mine at that point to like do what we've done today. I don't know that I had the mindset to like want to help over a thousand different businesses, yeah. right? Which is what we've helped now in the last six years. Um, but it naturally grew. And I, I always tell people that if you have a healthy product, you'll create customers that create customers. Heck right? yeah. Same thing with a culture. If you have a healthy employee, healthy culture, you'll have employees that create employees. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and actually you've, you've expanded out not to just the direct systems consulting, but you've now got a whole ecosystem of companies that support entrepreneurs even beyond once they've got their systems in place, they're hiring and all these other platforms. So, you know, you've kind of just kept going and going. You're, you are a great example of a serial entrepreneur. You, you just keep tacking on new, new tools, new opportunities for people to service them. So that's pretty cool. Um, you I know, wanna... some of the times the most, most basic things in life, Mario, give us ideas. Um, and so it's funny, you know, you think sometimes like when you have a, a success or accomplishment, it must have come some like some great moment, some w path of wisdom. And, uh, and I'll give you, <laughs> and I don't think I've ever said this on a podcast. So this will be the first time ever I've ever said it in recording. I think where my inspiration came from was it came from a Disney cartoon movie <laughs> and it was a movie called robots okay and the uh the guy the inventor of the tv uh, of, not the inventor of the tv show but the the character in it said find a need fill a need right yeah and i know it's a cartoon it's disney right but it literally launched something in me it was like if we're going to be successful at being an entrepreneurship you gotta find a need and feel the need we recently just talked about the fact that there's a big need right now in the industry, especially with entrepreneurs, to have an executive assistant. Yes. And so I told you just before the podcast, we are literally going to launch a company called Sharper EA, Sharper Assistants, that will allow somebody to have a process, a person, and a system to help manage their life as an entrepreneur. And, uh, and so that product's coming. But you're right. The goal here is to provide a one-stop shop solution through an ecosystem model that supports today's entrepreneur.
Love it, Gary. A couple things I want to point out. I mean, majority of the listeners here are commercial real estate investors and entrepreneurs of some type. I mean, a couple points that I wanted to make sure that everybody heard is Gary hit it pretty hard. I mean, he he had not only uh, a serious health issue pop up, but also market crashes right after that. I mean, he could have easily just sat down and said, forget it. Instead, he went the other direction. He got back on his feet, focused on where he wanted to go and did it. So I, I just want to point out that a lot of the people that you see that are super successful today have had major setbacks, including myself, and they just decided to go forward and push forward. And then the other thing is he's focused on going where the demand is. He's not creating things just because he thinks they're a good idea. He's, what was that? What was the quote you said from that movie? Find a need, fill a need. Find a need. Somebody's coming to you saying, I need this. I need that. Like, huh, I could probably fill that need. And then he creates the service offering around what he's hearing this this ecosystem or this client base say that they need, he, he can fill those needs as they come up. I love that. Hey, let's talk a little bit about what does it look like when someone needs systems in their company? Because I've, I've personally seen, I mean, I'm in several groups, uh, uh, networking groups, masterminds, I've got an education company, everything. And, and a lot of these investors, they start out, they start buying some, you know, either mobile home parks or other commercial real estate. They get to a certain size. It's usually around four assets or so, and they go, okay, I'm overwhelmed now. And they, they, the, the, the once visionary CEO person is now like in the day-to-day -day ops getting just, just creamed. What does it look like that? I mean, you see tons of these companies. What does it look like when you see somebody that needs systems in their companies? You know, usually what happens is to, to, we see, we see more symptoms than we see problems. It's like going to a doctor. Uh, you go to the doctor because you have symptoms. When people come to us, they come to us because there are symptoms creating a problem. And, and, and getting to that root cause of the problem is the, probably the harder part of the whole thing. Um, one thing I do want to clear up, and I think this is an interchangeable term that gets confused sometimes, is the word system. Like, what is a system? Because if you talk about the word, word system in the, a different niche, you're talking about, like, you're usually talking about software. Yeah. Right. It could be a software system. It could be system in some niches could be process. And I think that's universally what systems are usually referred to more of like what's your system, what's your process is what they're saying. Uh, but there's operating systems as well, like how we run our business, just like an operating system for our computer has this, this is the operating system. And then within that, you have processes and, and documents and, and other type of things that the system helps you manage. And so that's what uh, we focus on is not just the system of how to run your business, but the processes that fit within that system, the people that fit within that system, the vision that sits within that system, the communication that sits within that system, the metrics that sit within that system. And, uh, and I will tell you, I think one of the things that we can see pretty quickly is lack of system, thinking about operating system, creates a lack of confidence. That's good. Right? And lack of confidence a lot of times creates fear. So a lot, I always tell people there were five, re, you know, four reasons we don't grow. Number one is fear. We don't grow because of fear. You know, fear of the unknown, fear of not, not having, and how do we overcome that knowledge? That's one of the key things to overcoming fear is knowledge. You know, we have to think on that, which is true. And the only way to understand the truth is to what? Have knowledge of it and sustain right. that with faith. Number two is mindset. You know, the second system that show, or, symptom that shows up is poor mindset like they think that they are the ones that can only ones that can do it or it all depends on them or if they don't if they don't do a certain thing they'll fail or, or if they let go then 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 uh the system will fail or the people will fail and so now our mindset becomes number two and three is is connections um when somebody's struggling with systems and, and things like that their head's so far down in the sand they don't make the right connections for their business and when you don't have the right connections for your businesses and you're limiting your business growth to your 100 percent your 100 percent of the time your 100 percent of knowledge your 100 percent of resources and if that's all the company is depending on then the company's never going to grow past you right it's going to get to your 100 percent stop and, and depending on what your knowledge is. And that's why you see some companies make it a little further in the race than other companies because how much knowledge did that CEO bring in? But every company at some point has to do an assessment, like a blood work, of where you are, what you're missing, and what you need to get confident in 
in your system, processes, and people, vision, metrics, things like that. I always tell people, you have to be profit confident. You have to be people confident. You have to be communication confident. You have to be metric confident. You have to be vision confident. If you're not confident in those areas, you're never going to grow a business, right? And if you do grow it, and you can have some level of success, but you're never going to truly reach your full potential or that company's full potential. That's that. awesome. So let's just kind of pause really quick. And you're going to hear us probably use the word like integrator or COO quite a bit, or it could be even like considered a business manager, office manager, something like that. Yeah. When should someone bring on an integrator or a COO or a, uh, an office manager type role that handles the day-to-day operations? So and that's, I am love that we frame that properly because an integrator, which is a term thrown around a lot in real estate right now because of the word book traction. Mm-hmm. First of all, we need to understand that the word integrator is an ideology. It's not a position. So you can't go posting integrator on, you know, on boards and try to get somebody to apply. They, most of the world doesn't understand what that term is. Okay. That term does represent a position. That position could be anything from an office manager all the way up to a COO. The goal of that ro- that role is to integrate the vision of that business, depending on what level you're at. If you know, I we we have a company called Empire Empire Operating Model, and that operating model is the system that we use in Sharper, and that I've helped design and develop and write uh, to get companies to the next level, what level they need to be at. In that system, we talk about the five phases of business, and so depending on what phase you're in. Mario, you might need a different level person. There's a good book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, okay? And the premise around that is in a lot of things, but with people, what got you through stage one won't get you through stage four, okay? And so understanding what that role is, where you're at as a business and what your business needs are. Um, I get a lot of times in real estate where people, they get stuck on one profile, they get stuck on one type of person, and they they feel like they got to go after the Taj Mahal type integrator using that term and this and that's great and they if they could afford it and they could do that that's great but the problem a lot of times is that person wants to run and grow faster than the business can it's not where it needs to be and so that person burns out or they get frustrated or they leave or they don't ever set the job in the first place so if you're in a stage one to stage two we're really looking more for like an uh, you know it's, it might even be an assistant in stage one an ea stage two it probably more like an office manager you know somebody that's pro- process focused you know, stage three, you start to change that profile a little bit. You're starting to get more into starting to bring visionary components, leadership components into that role so they can help solve problems and delegate and elevate with you. And then you go, it goes from there. And then the, the level of that, that person's ability and knowledge has to expand as the business expands. They have to either grow with the business or you have to bring somebody in that's already at the level you want to be at. And so that integrated role is important. I always tell people, Mario, I never start a new business without hiring the integrator first. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> and that could be anything. It could be an EA, it could be my integrator to start the business, right? But it is somebody who could harmoniously integrate my vision. Because Let's one thing talk I've about learned that. Oh, go ahead. Keep time. going. Keep going. No, no. I mean, one thing I learned about myself is I won't, right? I need somebody who can take the ideas, take the things I want to do and create structure around them. I can do fine creating the vision and accountability of the vision. I just struggle with the implementation of said vision. And that's that so. whole CEO, CEO relationship. Gary and I did kind of a, a short, I think it was a reel or something like that. We put, it went out on Instagram and YouTube and all the, and TikTok, and it actually did very, very well. And I asked Gary, can you talk about the relationship between a CEO and a COO or what is the COO to you as the CEO? And then I went to his COO and said, Hey, what is the CEO to you being the COO? And they both kind of answered it and it was awesome. It was like, they were talking about each other and it did very well, but maybe you could kind of touch on that. Like, can you talk about that relationship with the sure. CEO versus COO and kind of how that works? Yeah. So CEO's job is to be in charge of the vision, the big relationships, the, um, research and development of an organization. Um, Their job is to be creative problem solvers. Their job is to lead with emotion. Their job is to push the business and, you know, see the turns before the turns happen in a a company. Where an uh, an integrator or a uh, COO level person, his, their job is to harmoniously integrate said vision. Uh, Their their job is to to drive the culture and the vision down toward the organization. Their job is to lead, manage, hold the business accountable at all costs. Their job is to make sure that we stay in the profits, 
and that the vision and strategy of the organization is rendering the right profit for the organization. Um, I will do tell people the CEO's job is never to tell a visionary no. It's not. You should not. As, you, as a COO, your job is not to tell your visionary CEO no. Your job is to tell them how. I like okay? that. <laughs> yeah. And so the how sometimes could be what's the name of that new company and do you need help finding another integrator? <laughs> right? It's <laughs> <laughs> so what it could be. And we need to hear that as visionaries, right? But I could tell you that if my integrator, my CEO told me no, I'm going to find out how else I can get it done. Just right. the way it is, right? Because we don't like the word no. And, uh, and, and it's not that we're egotistical driven people. It's just that if we see a good need or an idea or we can fulfill a need, we're going to want to try to do that, especially if we have the ability to do that thing. So I think that's important to understand the difference between the two. Um, the COO of an organization uh, does have to be someone who leads more based on logic. We're mm -hmm. looking for a logical decision maker there uh, because you don't want emotion at both levels touching the front line of a, a business because it's chaotic. You want that balance between emotion and logic. That's good. It's super good. Sorry, I'm if you're watching this on on YouTube, I'm taking like I'm already almost a full page of notes here because um, I I love this podcast because I can just sit here and pick Gary's brain, ask him any question I want for the next. 30 minutes and he's got to answer it. So he's under, he's under pressure. So I basically get all my questions answered too. Hey, Gary, what is, what is um, kind of the difference between maybe a large organization like you used to consult in the past to maybe more of the companies that like mine or others where, you know, we're growing, but we're not some large corporation publicly traded, whatever. What's kind of the difference in the systems and how that, that looks? So in, in an organization that's much bigger, you're focusing more on productivity um, and profits and people. Those are the three Ps, you know, you know succession planning, top grading, uh, leadership, development of your staff, you know, HR, the emotional paycheck. Um, you're focusing more on that with the people, the, the process side of it. You're not just documenting processes anymore. You're creating your leaning process. You're driving productivity or creating automation. Um, you're spending more time in research and development. You're spending more time in policy and 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 that area of of that. I think the other one is the profits. You're you're definitely um, you're you're very very profit focused. Um, you have a shareholders to to suffice, and uh, and your projection. Um, you go to more of an accrual model from expense, so you can project better in profits than you do from a just a budgeting perspective. Mm -hmm. And so there's an there's a budget plus accrual type system in, in, in a big, bigger business where as an entrepreneur, I mean, it's really a, it's really the fundamentals of business that we're focused on. It's how to run a meeting, how to hire, you know, what is hiring the right person look like? Do we know our culture? Do, how do we, when we hire people, do we use, you know, what core values do we use? Those things are so much set in stone already. When you get up to a fortune 500 level, they've been there, they were established, they're, you know, they're well, well uh, preserved. Uh, where when I got into entrepreneurship and started coaching entrepreneurs, like, it was really hard. I'm like, hey, can you send me your numbers? And they're like, what numbers do you want to see? I'm like, your numbers. Yeah, well, what numbers? <laughs> like, we did 15 contracts last week. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't help me. What What about your profits? What about your budgets? What about your variance report? Could you send me your key process indicators? Can you send your performance indicators? What about your key profit indicators? Can you send me those? And they're like, what are those? I'm like, you've heard of KPIs <laughs> before, right? I'm like, yeah, key performance indicators. I'm like, no, there's two other types of KPIs. There's a profit indicator and there's a process indicator. Like, I need them to have those too. And they're like, I have no clue what you're talking about. I'm like, okay, so what's your process? Well, I, I told Joe to go out on the appointment and Joe brings me back a contract. And it's like, <laughs> it's very basic, right? Like, and well, does he bring back the contract every time? No. What's the difference between why he brings back one time and the other time? I don't know. Like they don't understand their process. And so everything's being winged in a certain way. And that's okay for most visionaries because they're mavericks or venturers or things like that. And they like the, you know, the constant change, but that doesn't build, that doesn't build well, right? Yeah. Like you have to have consistency and, and predictability to some degree in a business. And so sustainability becomes very important for, for an entrepreneur. We're a larger business, very sustainable business. Now it's all about productivity, you know, people 
and pays about time, money, resources. Yeah, that's super good. I, I know for me, when I was kind of putting together KPIs, let, let me jump back, actually. I started out implementing systems in my company. I was a, I was a, I was a firefighter, you know, really is what we were. Our, our company had been growing, growing, growing. We hit kind of a plateau because everything that we had bought and acquired and started managing had all these little problems in it because we weren't systematic about what we were doing. We weren't being consistent in how we did things and all those, you know, boring, repetitive things that we need, we weren't doing. It was kind of like, yeah, do it this way this time and this way the next time. And it created all these fires. And so at a certain point, we kind of hit a plateau and we became firefighters. We we're just putting out all these fires from a year before or two years that we created, you know, two years before. And that's what told me that I needed to get systematic about what I was doing. We needed process, procedures, policies, all that. And I tried to implement it myself. And I would say I did probably a, on a scale from one to 10, maybe I was about a four. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. I'm just not, I'm not number one. My personality is not an operations person. So for me to implement systems in my company, I'm just not that great at it. But so yeah, yeah. after implementing it for like a year, I found Gary and being able to learn from these guys and having them help me implement like our meeting structure and do all this other stuff. I mean, it's a totally different business now. I mean, I'm not involved in the day-to-day operations anymore. And so all these things that he's talking about, like setting up your KPIs and your key profit indicators and your uh, key process indicators, it just makes a world of difference in the real world for that entrepreneur or for that CEO type individual. It's just a a different ball game altogether. So that's huge. And I think until you go from not having it to having it, you just don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're, you don't know how bad it is. (laughs) Yeah. So that's super good. This episode is sponsored by CREOPS. If you own a commercial property management company, own a real estate asset management company, or you're a commercial real estate investor or syndicator, you need to get with CREOPS. They can help you implement proven systems into your company to help you get out of the day-to-day operations and into that ownership seat. They'll help you implement the three Ps, which is processes, procedures, and policies. They'll help you structure your management team, implement KPIs, and assist with recruiting and a bunch of other things. I started this company and partnered with the top consultant that helps small businesses and in the past helped Fortune 500 companies implement business systems and scale rapidly. Go to creops.co, that's C-R-E-O-P-S dot C-O. Again, it's creops.co, C-R-E-O-P-S dot C-O, and tell them that you heard about it from the Mario Dottillo show. It, one question I was going to ask you for, for, for basically recruiting top talent, you kind of touched on that a little bit, you know, being a smaller company, maybe, a, a maybe some of these listeners have a portfolio of anywhere from, I don't know, three commercial assets all the way up to maybe 20. Um, they've got, you know, some employees and things like that, but how do, how do we go and continue to improve not only um, the people that we already have, but how do we start finding those super solid people for our company? Well, I think one of the things, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I I think we got to start with us as an entrepreneur. You got to start with you first before you just jump into like trying to hire other people. Uh, you know, if you're not willing to lead yourself, then you have no right to lead others. And so I think it starts with you. Uh, and what I mean by that is understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are. We do a um, we do an exercise with people. We have them list out what they do every day. I, I call it a um, I call it a labor paint, where they paint out their labor, uh, how whether they spend their time every hour by the hour for two weeks, and then we take that and we say, all right, I want you to put it in a couple categories, right? I want you to put it in things that energize you, and things that de-energize you, and things that you shouldn't have done. Like just should have done. Like it was just a waste of time. Brought you no value. Uh, we call that uh, non-essential or non-value add activity, right? NVA, uh, non-value add activity. So anything that's a non-value add didn't bring value to you, didn't bring value to your customer, didn't bring value to your business. You shouldn't have done it. Like those are the first things we got to get rid of. Because what you don't want to do is just like a company. You want to lean out you. You want to lean your process because a lot of times we put all this extra junk on ourselves that causes capacity issues, and we real realize how much of 
capacity we have that will get robbed from us and pulled into other areas uh, that we shouldn't be doing. And so uh, once you have that and you feel like everything on your list is NVA or value add VA, it's value added activities, uh, then you need to keep that stuff, but then you gotta evaluate, should I do it? Am I the best person for it? Does this energize me or does it de-energize me? And if you're good at something and you like to do it, it energizes you. If you're not good at something or you don't like to do it, then it de-energizes you. Yeah. Okay. And I'm all about protecting our energy. Right. And uh, when I got sick, I can tell you the doctor said I had six months left to live. What was he saying? He was saying you have six months of energy left. That's how much battery you have. Right. And have you heard Mario before somebody's like gets, gets bad news. And it's like, they, they're going to, you know, something's going to take them. They're going to pass away and they go quicker than everybody anticipated. And so what happens is that energy drains faster. Right. Yeah. My wife was pretty cute to that. And so she was, she protected me from everything that would drain my energy, negative people, negative situations, bad TV shows, like all kinds of stuff. Anything that came in that literally felt like I was soul sucking me out, you know, then she would try to, 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 to put a wall up against it. So it wouldn't hit me. And so she did a good job protecting it. And I think she elongated that energy, that battery to be able to help me find a solution to get healthy. And so we were able to do that, but that's what we need to do as entrepreneurs and for our business. We have to identify what are the areas in which we need to energize what gives us energy. Uh, I got in at three o'clock this morning, right? I told you that earlier. I will came in from Salt Lake or some Vegas, got in at three o'clock this morning. It's roughly around 12. I slept about four and a half, five hours last night. I'm not tired. If you can tell I'm not very energetic. Right. Why? Because I do what I love to do. Yes. And everybody's like, how do you, I, I looked at my Apple phone and it was like, I sleep 5.5 hours a night because it tracks your sleep it apparently now. And I'm like, wow, like I didn't even realize it. it's not like I go to bed and get up and I'm like, ah, oh, crap, I got to get up early. No, I just go to sleep and I wake up when I wake up, my body puts me to sleep and wakes me up. You know, I, I, there, I don't have, we, I think it's fun for me because I'm at a point in life where I don't have to set a clock anymore. That's so awesome. I don't have, I don't have <laughs> alarm clock. I just go to sleep when I'm tired and I get up when I'm awake, you know? And if in the middle of the day I get a little tired again, I go lay down, I take a nap, you know? Like I give my body what it needs when it needs it, right? Like I don't, I don't tell my body, no, this is the only amount of time you get to sleep, nor do I force it to stay in bed. Why? Because I feel like I protect my energy, That's right? Awesome. And I don't feel like I drain my battery in full. When you have a cell phone and it drains all the way to zero, does it take longer to charge back to 100%? Yeah. Sure it does. But if it only drops to 80%, you don't have to put it on charge all night long. Right? So and basically so, what you're what I, saying, Gary, is we need to first focus on ourselves, get the stuff off of our plate that is de-energizing us, find what we love to do because that's going to give us more energy, and that gets us in a position where we're a great leader. So then yeah, we can go well, out and recruit this, those. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I mean, you... Yeah, you want to be a great leader. You want to, it gives you the ability to have the right mindset. It gives you know helps you to make the right decisions. So, I always find as an entrepreneur, small entrepreneur of a smaller company, stage one, stage two type business, we have less than five employees or zero. Uh, we want to delegate to them the things that we are not good at that we don't like to do that drain our energy, right? And then I want to go find somebody with the right personality behaviors. That is going to be energized by the things I don't like and I'm not good at. And if I so, can find somebody like that, boy, that's a win for them because it energizes them. It's a win for me. We were talking about my executive assistant. You're like, she's really on her game. Like, she's really yes. good at what she does. She's good. Well, that's because she has the right profile and she actually really loves what she does. And you can see it. So, so we shouldn't go recruit people we like because they're just like us? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's fun for a party. Yeah. But not all parties end well. There's right? a lot of truth in that. <laughs> and so I, I would, I would say surround yourself in business with people that like to do the things you don't or are good at the things you're not. And listen, there, are, there's like a cross between some of that. I find myself someone, I really like doing that. I'm just not good at it. So I shouldn't do it. Vice versa. I really, I'm really good at it. I actually really good at process mapping. I'm certified in process mapping. Guess what? I don't like it. Don't <laughs> Susan like it is all. very good at it. His wife is is an absolute rock star in it. So yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. so that's the one who handles it, not you, huh? 
Right. So like I come in from a, what we call a champion of the process to look at it and go change this, change that. Let's, let's fix this. Where is that problem from? Why? Because what I am good at, what I do like to do is identify and solve problems. Right. And so I, I like to whole poke. I like to challenge the status quo and process and mapping it and document it allows us to do said thing. And I think that's where it becomes fun for me. But what doesn't become fun is designing the box and typing in the box and creating the lines off the box. None of that, none of that sexy to me. Like, yeah. I don't know about you, but I just don't enjoy it. drives it. me nuts, man. Right. <laughs> the best feeling, and, though, is, is when you're in a group. I just took a picture of our L10 meeting on Tuesday, our group meeting on Tuesday, they were talking about a process map that they built out and it was all complex. It was a pretty, you know, complex system or a process, I should say. And they were all talking amongst each other about how they built it out and how it's working. And I'm like, yes, I wasn't even involved in this. That's the best part about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is the best part is when you get people doing the things that you don't like to do or you're not good at. And when they energize, like you saw them, they get excited and it's an emotional paycheck for them. That's the win, right? And so as an entrepreneur, long-winded long -winded answer to your question, Mario, I think it's complex because it, the hiring people can be very complex. But to simplify it down, like lead you. Find the things you're not good at, you don't like, that inner, don't, don't energize you and stop doing them. Yeah. And I would say that carries over in your personal life too, right? Like there are things personally I just don't like to do, right? Like, so I have somebody that cuts my grass, you know? And you say, well, that seems a little self-indulgent to have somebody else cut your grass. Like you can't afford it. I mean, is you above cutting your grass? Well, that, okay, so that's not the reason why I have somebody cut my grass. The reason why I have somebody cut my grass is because it does de-energize me. I'd rather go play pickleball for right. energy, right? I'd rather go play pickleball than cut my grass. But what it does allow me to do is it allows me to stay at my better battery at a higher level so that when I do go do the things I love to do, I have enough energy for them. That's good. You yeah, know, mowing, there is cleaning, nothing, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff. Mario, that Mario, there is nothing worse in this world than to be an entrepreneur and start to resent the things you love to do because you don't have time or energy to do them. Mm -hmm. That's good. Right? You've built a pretty phenomenal team throughout your companies. And one thing that I would say is kind of interlaced throughout all of them is that you've got a lot of family within your, within your organization. And my dad and I are business partners. We started the company together. And a lot of times when I tell people that my dad's my business partner, they kind of look at me and go, Ooh, what's it like to be, you know, how's that going? And I'm always like, great. We trust each other. We love each other. We are looking out for each other. Like there's a lot of reasons why what him and I do together are just very, very good. Could you maybe talk about how working with family is, has been such a success for you? Sure. For, first of all, I'd say it's not for everybody. And so don't look at our business to say they do it. We could do it too. Right. <laughs> um, I, I do think it takes, um, and this is going to sound a little braggadocious, but I think it takes really strong leadership to have to, to be willing to lead family. Yeah. And, and what does that look like? It looks like being willing to fire family, right? You got to be part. willing. The other thing I would tell you that uh, it becomes a much easier in business when you stop looking at the business like it's yours and you start making decisions based on what's in the best interest of the company. And if it's not in the best interest to hire family, then you should not hire family. If it's not in the best interest of the company to hire someone who has no experience in a certain area, then you shouldn't do that. You're setting yourself up for failure. And I think a lot of the reasons why people don't succeed in working with family is because they do them a favor versus what's in the best interest of the business. Yeah. They're you know? trying to hook up their family member and not, not get the best person for the seat. Yeah. And so I don't do that. And nor do I, when I feel like I've made a decision or the business has changed and the business can't, you know, it's not in the best interest of the business to have that person, I will not keep them around. And I'm, I, I'm very straightforward with that when I hire them. And so it's easier even now, probably the first three or four people I hired that were family, like that was kind of a question. Would he really? Yeah. Right. Now it's not really a question anymore. <laughs> no, he will. Right. And so, um, I, I think everybody understands and respects the fact that it's not about them and it's not about me. It's about what's in the best interest of the business. 
which includes me, by the way, if I'm not the right fit for this organization anymore, I mess up, I do something wrong, you know, um, then I may have to step away from the company. Doesn't mean I lose the owner's box, but I might have to step away from working in the business. And if I do that, which I, I've done, not messed up, but done in a lot of cases, stepped out of working in my businesses, uh, the only one I still work in is consulting business because I enjoy it. It actually gives me energy. And, and I have the time to. So it, that's freedom to me. Freedom's not about like sitting on the beach somewhere. Freedom's about doing what you want to do in life. And that I want to consult. I literally find joy and comfort and, and peace in helping people grow. And so that area is the only place in the business I still live in. But at any point, I feel like I forfeited the right to sit and I see I would vacate it for sure. the best interest of the business, right? I wouldn't take the whole company down just because of ego. And nor should any family member. Um, I am, my mom came to me. I love my mom. We're best friends. We've always had a great relationship. My mom and dad have been my biggest fans my whole life. Uh, they've always invested in me. They've always seen in me what I didn't see even when I wasn't a good kid. And they've always encouraged me to pursue my dreams. My mom came to me not too long ago, and she's up in age. And she's like, hey, mom's a little bored. I don't have a lot to do. I think it would be good for me to work and stay energized and things like that. And I said, mom, that's great. I said, I do have some openings I think you might be good for. And I actually personality index tested my mom. And she came back with the profile that would fit the seat. Mm -hmm. But there's other things that happen with people. You don't just hire a profile. You hire education. You hire, you know, strengths, weaknesses. You know, the, the whole person shows up to work, not just their right behavior. Yeah. And so when hiring there, I brought her on board and I had her shadow these meeting moderators, which I was going to have her do. And a couple of weeks went by and I, I remember asking the leader of that department. I said, hey, how's it going? And she says, oh, I think it's going good. I said, so my mom is moderating and she's like no no not yet i said well wait a minute what's our process she said well two weeks of shadowing i said oh so she'll start moderating on monday probably not okay <laughs> why not did we change our process well no we need to give her more time no we don't our process is two weeks yeah it's not in the best interest of the business to give her more time is she the right person or not well, she seems to really enjoy wanting to watch the moderator, but she doesn't really want to engage in working as a moderator. Well, that's not what I hired her to do. Right. <laughs> so I called her, my mom, and I said, hey, mom, what's going on? And so I said, how much do you like working in the business? Here, I really like it. I like it a lot. It gives me something to do. Good, good. Hey, our two weeks is coming up, and our process is that you would start moderating Monday. Are you ready to do that? No, I don't know. I don't think I'm ready to do that. But I really enjoy watching them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I can't afford you to sit in a seat that you're not going to work in. I said, and I appreciate the fact that you enjoy watching it. But mom, if you can't do the job, do you think it's in the best interest of our company to have you sit in that seat? She says, well, maybe probably not. I said, okay. Can we do this? Can I do this? Can I, if I find something else that might be a better fit, we'll try that too. And we'll maybe we'll just keep trying some new things until you figure out something that you want to do that fits your profile. And she says, yeah, I don't mind that. That'd be a good idea. And Mario, what it come down to is, you know, um, I don't really have something that somebody can sit there and watch somebody else do. Right. Okay. And so I said, Hey mom, what if I just paid you not to work for me? <laughs> it's the nicest fire I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, I, but I appreciate that. And I could use some extra money, but like, I still want to fulfill my time with some. I said, mom, don't you love helping the church? She says, I do love helping the church. I said, you know, they have this new, whatever it was. And I said, you could go there and be a part of that. And if you, if you were being paid by me to go do that, how's it any different than doing being paid for me to do a job? She says, well, Gary, I don't want you to pay me to go do something like that. I said, mom, why do you not, do you not love that? Do you not love the idea of doing that? So well, Gary, I'd love that. I said, well, then that's what I think we should do. That's so cool. I was like, really? <laughs> so you don't understand, like, you can hire and fire people and family members without being a jerk. Yeah. Right? But you have to make those decisions based on what's in the best interest of your business. Okay? I did feel like it was the best interest of my business for this profile, this person, and my mom, who has all this experience, to do that. She'd be very nurturing in a meeting to help people keep focus. But when her desire did not match up to her ability, then I couldn't leave her in the seat. Yeah. You just can't do it because the that, company can't, you can't just do favors for people. Otherwise, company goes under just helping people. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, there are two things that we measure with family. One is, are they a high trust person? And I don't trust all family, just being honest with you. Okay. 
So I don't say yes to every family member because I don't trust them as a person. That's number one. Number two is do I trust them to perform? And if I can't answer both of those questions, I don't hire them. But you know what? That's no different than anybody else. If Mario, me and you work together, I'd ask you the same questions. So once you start doing favors versus what's in the best interest of the business, you put yourself in a very vulnerable position with family and it's not gonna end well. If you can distinctly keep those separate, then I think you're healthy. It's good. I saved the best for last though, Gary. Okay. Not only have you brought family into your business, but even you know the listeners can tell just in conversation, you've definitely brought faith into your business and you've, you've, you're very open about it. You know, you do a lot of educating as well. And just kind of hearing that interlaced throughout the entire, everything you do. I mean, obviously you're, you're bold about it. Has that ever affected your business? Is that, how, how did, how, how did you get comfortable doing that? And most importantly, what's kind of been the effect of that? Well, when someone asked me that question, I do, what's that? They said, because a lot of people are afraid to is why I'm asking. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I think uh, when I get asked that question, and I've been asked that question a couple of times, uh, what the effects of that on your business are. And I think the word effects and what you're referring to is what's the negative impact of it. And so uh, for me, the negative impact would be allowing myself to do be or be, do something I'm not. And the negative impact would be working with somebody I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Right. So for the effects of it is it keeps us healthy and it keeps good. us hungry. Right. And healthy and hungry are two very good combinations uh, as a business owner. And I think at any point, at, even with my staff, if I get to a point where my culture, my internal, my external customer doesn't align with my purpose, then it's unhealthy for me to be a part of. It's good. I've worked with clients before that didn't share in faith, and that's fine. Um, it can still be a healthy conversation. It's going to be a healthy uh, business. I can still help them as long as they don't mind that I'm still who I am. Right. When people ask me to accept an ideology or something that is not who I am, it becomes unhealthy for me, nor would I ask them to do that. And so I do accept people for who they are. I think Jesus did that. Of course. Pharisees did not. Right. The Bible talks about a Pharisee versus Christ and Christ accepted everyone. They came as they were. And so, you know, and, and with the idea, idea of belief, like he wants us to have, you know, we're the only creatures God ever created that gave us the open mind to make our own decision. Yeah. Right. And so, and to choose, have the power of choice. And so that's what I don't like about whether Christianity or I don't like about even government is where they take away your power of choice because we mm. weren't designed to not be able to choose. That's God did not design us that way. We were designed in the area of choice. And so this is my choice. And this is healthy for me to, to be bold with my, my faith. Um, I do think you have to be careful with it. And I'll tell you why. Because we serve a very sovereign God. We serve a God that is very loving. Um, and can come across at times of being abrasive. Christians can. And I think we have to be careful of that. Because he's not that way. The right. other thing too is that we have to be careful in how we protect him. Protect the name. If we're going to be bold with it, we have to protect it. And I need to be very clear to you, I am not a perfect individual in any way, okay? And nor do I represent God in a perfect way. I'm going to sin. I'm going to do things wrong. I'm going to, I, I, none of us are completely immoral all the time, right? We do make mistakes. And, and anybody that says they're not, I would really run the other way, okay? Because they're lying to themselves. And that's pretty, pretty dangerous place to be is be around somebody that doesn't even see that. But one of the things in our business is I don't want to create a reflection because my purpose is to do a good work. In exchange for that, I want to support God's work. So do good work, support God's work. Doing a good work for me is the quality of work. The Bible only talks about success one time. It's in Joshua chapter 1, 8, and it says to have good success. It doesn't have mm -hmm. great success. It says good success. So God measures the quality of success we have, not the quantity of success we have. That's good. So to do a good work. And so when we work with somebody, I do not charge them in full until we're done with our service. Why is that? Because if I didn't deliver value over price, I don't want to be paid. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you. I had a client recently, Mario, that reached out to me and he says, Hey, you charged us X. I think we got a Y in value. Probably one of the first times. Yeah. This I'm guy's surprised to hear that. Yeah. 
and and his business is a little outside the normal what we work with. And so I was like, okay, that can be possible. Now, the circumstances were this. We were supposed to work with him three days after my dad died. I ended up sending a different coach for the first day versus me. And a different than even the person that I was going to send originally. And so his perspective of what he was going to get versus what he got was different. And it's understandable. Sure. Did we deliver the same product? I think we did. Okay. I really, truly, in my heart, feel we did. But his perception is our reality. Right. So he's like, and honestly, I'm going to go ahead and pay you. But, like, I just wanted you to know because you say that. I said, okay, I appreciate that. He's, I said, what can I do to make that right with you? He says, what if we just had three more process documenting sessions? I feel like that would do it for me. Yeah. Now, was he trying to get more services out of us? Maybe, right? But at the end of the day, because this is my purpose and because I want to protect my image and the image of God, I said, okay, I do want to do that. But here's the thing. I'm not only going to do that. I'm going to come back and do another one day with you for free. That's cool. Yeah. And he was like, oh, you don't have to do that. That's not what I'm asking for. I said, no, but I never go to the level of expectation. I always go to the level of exceeding expectation because I'm going to represent God and do a good work then I want it to be done in the right way. I want you to know that the value was brought because I never want to reflect negatively on that. Yeah. You know, And so that's why I think we can be bolder about it because we're very precautious and protective of it. That's awesome. Yeah, you stand behind it. I love it. So just, to, we're, we're running out of time here. I wanted to just give everybody the opportunity to connect with you. He's on Gary's on all the social media platforms. I don't know if, if he, if he knows his own social media uh, titles or not, but we'll definitely put them in the description of the show. So you guys can connect with them. And he's putting out a ton of good content, like things like what we talked about today. I was really looking forward to doing this interview and we've been talking about it for a while and I see him every quarter. So you know, I've really been looking forward to doing this interview because I knew it was just going to be deep. And it was, I, I think we covered so much that the listeners and, uh, and myself can, can take and run with. I, like I said, I got an entire page of notes and I'm literally out of room on my page. So what we've done is I I've actually teamed up with Gary to create a service offering a company called Creops. You can check that out at creops.biz. Uh, you can also go to creopsprocess.com, but what it is is a service offering for commercial real estate investors like myself. So whether you're in the mobile home park space, uh, self-storage apartments, whatever, any type of commercial real estate or commercial real estate management, we've basically put together exactly what we've been doing in my company and, and that can be offered to other business owners or other commercial real estate investors so that it's customized to you. It fits your business model um, specifically. And I'm super excited to be working with Gary on this. There's no better person and no better team to be doing that with. So I appreciate that, Gary. And I've ac we've actually, uh, we're, we're in the works of, he's going to be doing some, some content for the MHP tribe course that we're putting out here, the new course that we're putting out. He's going to be in there talking about some, some systems and operations and process procedures, policies, all that kind of like what we talked about today, but pretty in depth. So um, just great to have you as a friend, Gary. I appreciate your time today. Make sure to connect with Gary on all the socials and uh, appreciate your time, brother. Yeah, I appreciate you too. Very unscripted and straight from the heart. And I, I love these type of interviews. So thank you for allowing me to be on. Hey guys, I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you got out of this as much as I did. I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so we can reach more people. Jump over to mariodatillo.net and find out what else I got going on. Be sure to connect with me on all the socials and I'll see you on next week's show.